Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. My name is Chiara Giorgetti, and I'm a professor of law at Richmond Law School, where I, my work focuses mostly on um, international dispute resolution, and particularly in arbitration. I'm also one of the vice president of ABILA, and, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today at today's panel, Beyond Fragmentation, Cross-Fertilization, Cooperation, and Competition Among International Courts and Tribunals. We have about 75 minutes for our panel, and we will keep about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please use the chat function to ask your questions. This panel also gives CLE, and I will provide a code that you need to enter to claim your CLE credit during the course of the panel. I'm joined today by four excellent highly qualified speakers and colleagues. Hélène Rouy-Fabry is a professor of law and director of the Mass Plan Institute Luxembourg for Procedural Law, where she leads the Department of International Law and Dispute Resolution. She also acts often as an arbitrator in international investment disputes and in trade disputes also. John Crook acts as an arbitrator often also in international investment arbitration and many other disputes at ICSI, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in other setting, and he teaches international arbitration at the George Washington School of Law. He's also a judge of NATO's administrative tribunal. Alina Miron is professor at the University of Angers in France and co-directs the Master II of International and European Law. And she often acts as counsel and advocate in several interstate disputes, including an international court of justice and the international tribunal for the law of the sea. Mark Pollock is a professor of political science and law and Jean Monnet chair of Tem at Temple University in Philadelphia, where he also serves as director of global studies. He has published widely on the politics of international law and international institutions, international courts, and the European Union. You can read, of course, much more about each of them in their websites, and I urge you to do so. They have wonderful accomplishments. Today, we are going to, uh, to talk about cross-fertilization in international courts and tribunals. And I'd like to start by noting that the international community in the 21st century is both more lawful and more judicialized than in any other period of human history. Um, by lawful or legalized, I mean that law has substantially developed more in breadth uh, and in depth uh, very substantially, and in a variety of areas, including the use of force, trade, finance, investment, the protection of the global environment, human rights, um, and several others. And it's also more judicialized in the sense that many body, many of this body of law are now subjects of interpretation and application by international courts and tribunals, like the International Court of Justice and other, which aimed at clarifying and interpreting the law authoritatively and to act and to settle disputes among, uh, its, uh, about its application. Yet the development occurred in a fragmented way and international law remains a plural order. And over the past half century, a number of specialized legal regi regimes have arisen uh, from trade to investment to environmental protection, human rights, and many others. And the multiplication of these legal regimes has been accompanied over the, over the years also by a proliferation of international courts and tribunals with several courts and tribunals and, uh, uh, that interpret international law and adjudicate international legal disputes. By the turn of the century, the initial post-war euphoria over the spread of international law, and, uh, international law in the courts gave way to a widespread concern about the fragmentation of international legal order into specialized and regional regimes, adjudicated by a non-hierarchical and possibly uncoordinated uh, number of courts and tribunals, with possibly overlapping jurisdiction and with the possibility of inconsistent or divergent interpretation. In our panel, which reflects our book project, we explore international judicial proliferation beyond this fragmentation. And we ask whether the proliferation of international courts and tribunal has produced harmful judicial competition, forum shopping, divergent interpretation um, and fragmentation, or rather whether international courts have been able to cooperate to solve or mitigate these concerns and produce not divergent or fragmented, but rather convergence and unity within the international legal order. We explore the interaction of different international courts from many different angles, and we look at processes of formal and informal cross-fertilization in practice. 
And in so doing, we address several important uh, themes. Professor Pollock, would you please start, start us uh, and just explain maybe a little bit uh, the background of the project and maybe the overview uh, of this project on cross-fertilization of courts and tribunals? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chiara. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, coming this afternoon. So Chiara has already done a great job of summarizing the fundamental questions in the background of the book. Um, I think the book is a rich one. It has nine chapters by leading scholars and practitioners, and we have four of those chapters represented here, and I won't try to summarize them all. So let me just start off the discussion very quickly with two sort of framing comments uh, about the book that goes a little bit beyond what Kiara has already told you. Uh, so first, I want to summarize uh, where the book fits into the larger literature about fragmentation, plurality, management, judicial dialogues, judicial cross-fertilization, and all the other terms that we have to think about these concepts. And then secondly, I'll just briefly mention the three main themes of the volume that are going to play out over the course of the uh, papers that you're going to hear um, uh, discussed here. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the chapters that focus most closely on each of those themes. So with respect to the literature, Kiara and I argue that the scholarship on legal and uh, judicial fragmentation has evolved over the past uh, three decades or so in three phases, which we call in turn uh, the postmodern anxieties phase, followed by a second and more optimistic management phase, and then finally a third phase for which we don't really have a catchy name, but which you might call the critical reconsideration phase. So very quickly in the first phase, uh, leading scholars and also practitioners looked at the legal and judicial proliferation of the 1990s um, and asked whether those phenomena threatened the unity of the international legal order. Uh, Chiara and I review that literature, and I won't go into the details, but it's fair to say that the primary fear of this period was the specter of inconsistent or divergent judicial rulings. Uh, and this literature was summed up by Koskinyemi and Lino uh, in, under the rubric of postmodern anxieties, although those authors already in 2002 were suggesting that the worst fears of the pessimists have not manifested themselves. So this then led to a second and more optimistic phase, which we call the management phase. After Laurence Boisson de Chazon's uh, management theory, although it also include Chester Brown's uh, common law of international uh, procedure and Murray Slaughter's work on judicial dialogues, Chiara's work on cross-fertilization um, and lots of empirical work by scholars like Jonathan Charney and Philippa uh, Webb. And what all those works had in common was an optimism that the inconveniences of legal and judicial fragmentation could be proactively managed by international judges and arbitrators who would both refer and defer to each other's judicial practices and judgments producing legal convergence rather than divergence over time. And then finally, thirdly, we discuss what we think is a, a, an emerging strand of scholarship, uh, most notably by scholars like Yuval Shani and uh, Thomas Strines, who've suggested that cross-fertilization and management might be more difficult and more complicated than the management school suggests. So if you think of the postmodern anxiety school as the thesis and the management school as the antithesis, we think this third school is the sort of synthesis. And it's in this spirit of uh, synthesis or critical reconsideration that we undertook this project of this volume to revisit the question of um, judicial cross-fertilization and address the nature, the variations, the gaps, the asymmetries in that process. So against that backdrop, the volume is organized around three main themes which we call procedural cross-fertilization, substantive cross-fertilization, and finally the actors of cross-fertilization. And it was at the beginning Chiara's insight to suggest that the volume uh, should really uh, distinguish between what might in fact be quite different processes of procedural, procedural and substantive cross-fertilization. Uh, and also to understand that cross-fertilization could include a much wider variety of actors than the states, parties, and judges who were at the heart of the management, appro uh, management approach. So just to set up what we're about to discuss with respect to procedural cross-fertilization, we wanted to understand whether and how states were borrowing from each other's procedural rules and practices. And if so, whether that was really leading to a convergence of judicial practice, as Brown had argued. Um, in the book, we're lucky to have the two chapters that you're about to hear. 
um, by uh, Hélène Ruiz Fabry and Josh Payne and by John Crook. Um, and both of them, as you can see, I think are generally uh, quite optimistic about procedural cross fertilization, although both also uh, point to some limits uh, in this area. I should add that there's also a really interesting third chapter in this section by Rebecca Hamilton, who studies how various international courts are dealing with the problem of assessing digital evidence and dealing with the problem of so-called deep fakes. Um, and for us here, I think the take home point from Hamilton's chapter is that what she calls organic or decentralized cross fertilization uh, has been too slow to deal with this uh, problem. With respect to substantive cross fertilization, which takes place largely, uh, although not exclusively, through cross citation across international courts and tribunals, we have a pair of really uh, interestingly contrasting chapters. The first is the one that you're about to hear about in a minute or two by uh, Alina Miron about the emerging acquis judiciaire with respect to the law of the sea, while the second one is a study of cross fertilization by Eric Voten in the field of human rights. And as you'll hear, um, Alina's story is very much one of successful substantive cross fertilization, while Eric finds evidence of a much more limited and much more asymmetrical story in the human rights realm for reasons I think that we'll come back to later. Um, and then finally, again, the third theme is about the actors of cross fertilization, but we're going to come back to that issue. So I will stop there and turn it back over to Chiara. Thank you very much, Mark, for a wonderful introduction. Um, so, as, as as you said, one of the uh, one of the theme of the book, and so this is really part of a of a book project for a forthcoming book on with uh, with Cambridge that should be coming out um, really in the next in the next few months. One of the one of the theme that we we discuss is the issue of cross fertilization in procedural law. And we really start by thinking, so international courts receive very kind of vague guidance from statutes and rules of the court from, from on many areas of procedure. And one may think that, expect that the courts and tribunals have very distinctive substantive coverage and diverse, uh, 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 with, 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 with such diverse uh, jurisdiction and diverse uh, um, jurisdiction uh, ratione persone also, they would have very different approaches to procedural question. Yet what we, what we find is that a growing body of literature suggests that states actually learn and borrow from each other and from the general principles of law in establishing uh, often procedural rules, which show signs of convergence across uh, both standing and arbitral uh, tribunals. So I will wonder, uh, John, if you could please maybe start us, at, uh, start us out and talk a little bit about what you have found in terms of cross-fertilization in procedural law. Thank you. Thank you, Kiara. And I'd like to thank uh, you and your, all the collaborators on the book, and of course, the, the American uh, branch of the uh, International Law Association for making this all possible. Um, your very kind introduction, I perhaps uh, didn't really convey the extent to which I have a long, lifelong in inability to hold a steady job. I've had a variety of uh, incarnations so I'm gonna offer something of a practitioner's perspective. I've been counsel, judge, arbitrator, um, government agent in, a variety, in various sorts of international disputes. And, and my thoughts are shaped very much by that experience. Now, as, as Kiara rightly indicated, there is no single text uh, that's common to the rules to procedure in international dispute settlement. There's no common doctrine of sources of law Nevertheless, uh, it seems to me there has been a significant degree of convergence in procedure used in structuring international disputes. Now, uh, again, as Kira suggested at first blush, this may seem a little odd. Um, institutions vary, they draw on people from differing regions, they draw on differing legal cultures. But having said that, uh, all of them face similar tasks. Law-based dispute settlement by its very nature presents some recurring problems. There must be a way to provide notice of the existing of a dis uh, existence of a dispute, to, to define its nature and extent, to identify the relevant rules of law, to identify the relevant factual issues and, and evidence, to apply the law to the facts, and then somehow to record in an authoritative way the result. Now, all processes involved in law-based international dispute settlement have to find ways to deal with this particular set of problems. 
Now, history has had a heavy hand, I think, in shaping how we deal with these. Uh, arbitration and other forms of law-based dispute settlement have been around for a very long time. Uh, but I would assign considerable significance in designing today's uh, procedures uh, to the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. The chapter three of the 1899 convention set out a set of rules of procedure for an interstate dispute. And on these little bare bone, they lack some of the refinements that we're used to today. Uh, but to a practitioner like me, they look oddly familiar. You, you, could, you could do a case with these. You might not have all the bells and whistles, but you could certainly manage a case on the strength of these. Now, these rules were the starting point for uh, the statute and rules of the PCICJ and in turn, the I, I International Court of Justice. And they continue to, their DNA continues to resonate today in places like the procedural provisions of the uh, uh, Washington Convention, the ICSID Convention. Now, other important forces have contributed to convergence. Uh, UNCITROL, the UN Commission on International Trade Law has been a major force. Uh, in the 1970s, UNCITROL developed a set of arbitral rules that were intended to be acceptable across a wide range of political systems and legal cultures. These things got a crucial test in the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, which was something of a, was a difficult testing ground, but they stood up and they worked. And in the course of this, uh, a whole generation of young arbitration lawyers, and I was one of them, I was the American agent in the tribunal for a number of years at that time, um, discovered that these rules work and that the process of arbitration works. Uh, major institutions have subsequently adopted these as a foundation for their procedural rules. PCA generated a wide array of rules based on the UNCTRAL rules, and they continue to be used widely in ad hoc arbitrations, both in commercial and investment arbitrations and in disputes between states. Now, UNCTRAL has made other major contributions. Uh, a key one is its model law on investment arbitration, on, sorry, on, on uh, commercial arbitration, uh, which sets us framework for the interface between the process of arbitration and national jurisdictions. It's been adopted by 85 countries and about 115 different jurisdictions. It's been a powerful contribution to the global convergence of uh, procedure in arbitration and elsewhere. Now, non-governmental organizations have made an important contribution. The, American, the International Bar Association has developed a set of evidence rules that are today widely used in commercial and investment arbitration and that have relevance as well in some interstate cases. Uh, they've developed standards for guiding arbitrators' disclosures and uh, are at work on questions relating to uh, the ethical imperatives for both decision makers and counsel. <clears throat> Yet another significant contributor to, <clears throat> excuse me, to convergence is people, people like me who moved around from institution to institution, uh, drawing on past experiences to draw present, to find present solutions. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the panel. I think I've exhausted my five minutes, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much, John. We'd love to hear more, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that we'll hear more uh, more later. Um, this was very interesting, a very interesting introduction. And Elaine, I wonder if you want to follow up, and I know that one of the issues that you developed is also this idea of the pull toward, uh, towards uh, cross-fertilization. I wonder if you can tell us something about that or about also other, uh, other thoughts about uh, procedural cross-fertilization. Thank you very much. And uh, let me, like John, start by, by uh, thanking you and Mark and also the American uh, branch of the ALA for organizing uh, this, uh, this panel for a, a project which is uh, close to my, to my heart. And I, I like the project, I like the ideas, and I also like the people who had the opportunity to work together for this uh, project. So um, it's a joy to be with you, although for us, Alina and me, it's, it's Friday evening already. 
And Sorry. so um, it's not that easy to speak after John because he has already uh, used so many, so many ideas that I have the feeling that I'm going to repeat things that he has said so accurately. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, I will try to, 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 to bring um, compliments to what, what he said. Um, it is important to, 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 to underline indeed that uh, people dealing with uh, procedural issues might be very diverse uh, indeed, but at the end of the day, they face uh, similar uh, issues and they have to solve similar issues. Of course, there might be a difference between courts, interstate courts like the ICJ, and, and of course, uh, a criminal court like the, uh, the International Criminal Court, but at the end of the day, they, they nevertheless have to solve uh, issues which are of, of the same type. And uh, when uh, I started reflecting on, on that, uh, I had this assumption that, um, uh, like many people, uh, that these commonalities uh, uh, between the tasks to be accomplished made it that there would be a specific pool in favor of cross-fertilization. And to a certain extent, it is true. But at the same time, uh, this assumption is, is based on the idea that procedure is, is rather technical or neutral, and this is why cross-fertilization uh, would be uh, easier. It doesn't mean that uh, one fits all uh, solutions emerge, but at the same time that uh, it would be uh, easier than on substantive law, which has the reputation of carrying values. And yet, in fact, cross-fertilization or uh, studying cross-fertilization reveals among other things, the, the, the political potential of procedural rules. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, an opportunity to reveal some stakes which, are, which comes with the, the, uh, the, the procedure. And uh, that's also a very, very uh, interesting uh, aspect. Something which is also interesting beyond what uh, John said and the, the mini text to, to, to which he, he referred is that um, beside this text, uh, judges have to, to, uh, to make many uh, procedural uh, decisions along proceedings. And uh, they have uh, these procedural decisions are like bottlenecks in the process. If decisions are not, not made, the, the case cannot proceed. And uh, in other words, adjudicators have a duty to decide. And when you speak about the duty to decide, you, you tend to think about the final decision. But in fact, it is a duty which plays all along the proceedings and which involves a lot of, uh, would say what we could call micro decision, but which which are uh, one way decisions in the in the sense that once they are done, there is no way back most of uh, most of the time, and so they can play a role in in um, framing and shaping the proceedings. Yet, in terms of, of, of tools, uh, the statutes of uh, many courts are not very uh, talkative about procedure. And uh, going further, you will say, yes, but there are rules of procedure indeed. But what is interesting there is that uh, for most international courts, adjudicators themselves are in charge of making these rules. And in the few cases where they do not make these rules, they can nevertheless make other instruments, maybe soft law instruments like practice directions or guidelines or directives or manuals. But in a way or another, I would say that the procedural uh, lawmaking of adjudicators is, is far broader or, or far more important than what might think. And if you add to that what uh, Kiara uh, said, uh, pre mentioned previously, the fact that they can use general principles, although they do not use general principles so much in practice, but they can also use inherent powers. They can also uh, call for the sound administration of justice. And, uh, and so uh, all these tools are uh, as many tools which can be used as vectors for cross-fertilization. And uh, uh, good examples uh, in, nowadays are in uh, evidentiary law. In fact, if you look at, at most of, of the texts, they do not deal with evidence. And evidence have become, has become a, a more important, more and more important issues uh, along the fact that uh, cases have become more and more complex. The fact that uh, uh, modern technologies allow to bring more and more evidence at the same time 
um, makes it that uh, all courts in all types of cases face this issue of dealing with the, uh, an enormous body of, uh, of evidence uh, with the um, request of fact finding also, and they are not uh, equipped with rules to deal with that. And so they have to, to, to look for good means of, of uh, solving these issues. And uh, this is typically a field where you can find a cross fertilization because uh, adjudicators will logically tend to look at what others do to solve these kind of issues, even if it's not uh, exactly with the same type of, of, uh, of cases. So you have many tools which can be used, many opportunities also which can uh, uh, occur along proceedings for cross-fertilization. Uh, and last but not least, as John mentioned, you have also uh, multiple uh, actors playing a, a role that we will revert to that later in, in our uh, panel. What I would like briefly to mention is that uh, I may give the feeling of an uh, immense uh, discretion, and I think indeed there is a lot of discretion uh, to cross-fertilize in, in the field of procedure, uh, but this, uh, this discretion is not without limits, of course, because you have the, the control mechanisms which can play a role. And I think that the recent crisis at the appellate body uh, of the, the World Trade Organization shows very well that uh, um, the use of, of uh, this uh, procedural discretion can uh, can uh, trigger some kind of, of, of crisis uh, at some point. And, um, and uh, th this, uh, what can look as a very legitimate will by the appellate body to use collegiality to give legitimacy to its rulings, at some point could, could uh, uh, backlash. And so this we have seen. What I say is not a value uh, judgment. We were all aware of the political dimension of the crisis. This is not my point. It's just to say that um, even if judges have um, very wide discretion, this discretion is not without limits, if only because the stakeholders at some point uh, and at some point could uh, um, whistle that the game is over and uh, it happens as we can uh, uh, we can see. But uh, my uh, last remark very briefly will be to, to, to uh, echo in a way and prolong what uh, John mentioned. He, he mentioned this uh, grassroots text which anchored a kind of model a procedural model which remains useful today. John mentioned that uh, adjudicators could still use the Hague Convention of uh, 1899 as a, a guidance to, to procedural guidance to solve dispute. And I follow him on, on that. But I think that uh, more recently, uh, the, um, I would say the, the enormous body of uh, case law by international uh, human rights courts on due process also plays a role. Whether we like it or not, our legal education is shaped to think about uh, dispute settlement according to a, a standard uh, which is um, uh, framed and, and refined through uh, the, the, the case law of human rights courts. They, of course, they, they review what domestic courts uh, do, but at the same time, they, they, they convey ideas on what due process uh, should be, and, and uh, the porosity of ideas makes it that this standard is also penetrating all international courts, even those which are not devoted to human rights. So I think we also have this, uh, this evolution to take into account in the sense of a kind of harmonization. Um, I don't want to push this uh, too much, but I think we have to keep this uh, uh, in mind and maybe uh, wonder what it was uh, 50 or 60 years ago when we didn't have this body of case law by the human rights courts. Probably due process was not thought the same way by international uh, judges than it is uh, today. <laughs> I think I have exhausted my time and I give back the floor to, to Thank Kiara. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. This was very interesting and, and it gave us a lot of uh, very interesting uh, food for thought. Um, Alina, I, I wonder if now you actually you can, you can um, talk a little bit. Mark suggested that you has talked about, you, you, you looked into the, the issue of uh, acquis judiciaire. 
I wonder if you can tell us a, li a little bit about that and about your other uh, re reflections on uh, issue of procedural law. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chiara, and thank you for uh, organizing and putting up this panel after all the events we had previously in Washington. I'm looking forward to, to have the book as a uh, tool. Uh, yeah, uh, the topic of my um, of my article in the book was the Aki judiciaire in the uh, in the law of the sea, and I think there is a difference in the law of the sea um, and the Aki judiciaire and the law of the sea from the previous situations discussed by uh, John and Ellen uh, within the in the sense that. Uh, whereas the, the procedural uh, cross-fertilization generally occurs when you have several bodies, each with its own constitution, and compromis and things like that. In UNCLOS, actually, we have only one constitution, it's UNCLOS, and we have several judicial bodies which have to deal with that. And the, the, the fears of fragmentations actually in, the, in, two, in 2000, mostly arose about this the possibility to have several uh, judicial bodies actually interpreting the law differently, although the rules were literally the same because you only have UNCLOS. Now, uh, Mark explained very well that these fears uh, have been, these anxieties have been now overcome. And uh, I just want to show how it happened um, in, um, through the jurisprudence of these uh, various judicial bodies, ICJ, uh, ITLOS, but also uh, arbitral tribunals. And that's why I am using the, the concept of acquis judiciaire, um, even if I, I know it's not very, very well popularized for, for, for the moment. But I do think it adds something to our understanding of how the interpretation by these judicial bodies work. And I compared it with other, um, with other similar concepts, such as the one as um, of judicial dialogue, meaning uh, citation, discussion, application, cross-fertilization, through citation, but also purely informal exchange of information between the judges of various tribunals. And from this point of view, I do think that the acquis judiciaire, which is actually a, a gradual way of building not only harmonized law, but actually a new uniform law. It goes beyond harmonization. We are talking about uniform interpretation of the law. So, a key judiciary goes beyond mere courtesy of references. I do think there is a real feeling of judicial constraint that pulls uh, the, the, the judges towards an uniform interpretation of the law. Uh, um, the same may be said uh, about the precedent, which of course in international law does not at all mean that it seizes the binding effect of prior decisions. It may merely uh, mean a consideration of prior decisions taken either by the same tribunal, it is generally within this meaning that it, is, it has been used by the ICJ or even by other tribunals. So considerations of these prior decisions and the use of the same solution, unless there are uh, good reasons to deviate from this solution in the previous case law, or even sometimes precedent may mean just consideration of these uh, um, previous solutions as being part of the legal materials available to ascertain the law. So uh, the, the acquis judiciaire certainly goes beyond that because there is this feeling of having to not only refer, but to some extent defer to prior decisions, even if there is no positivist obligation to do so. And maybe the closest um, concept to acquis judiciaire would be the one of settled jurisprudence. Settled jurisprudence, meaning a, a jurisprudence constant, we say in French, it has been repeated in uh, various decisions with, uh, with the difference that uh, in uh, the law of the sea, these various decisions again come from uh, different judicial bodies. So maybe the acquis judiciaire gets closer to a uh, settled jurisprudence. And in, in procedural law, I don't have a lot of examples, but I do have one, is the delimitation of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. Here it was ITLOS that started the party, uh, whereas uh, the ICJ showed a lot of restraint in going to delimitation beyond 200 nautical miles, because actually this means consideration of very technical issues. But then the ICJ followed upon um, it was, and now we have a set of jurisprudence, arbitral tribunals, ICJ, it was 
will delimitate beyond 200 nautical miles. I'll, I'll stop here because I'm way beyond my time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And in fact, it's interesting because the, the ICJ, in fact, uh, did just that in, in the very recent Somalia-Kenya case. So it's very interesting how your reflection and, and, and those of others are really something that you see um, uh, in, in, in practice. Uh, so thank you to all for uh, kind of engaging in the first issue of or looking at procedural issues and looking at how, um, how these common procedures develop, what are the instruments and how um, and what are kind of the, the, the challenges and the, uh, the results. The second theme of the book, as Mark actually mentioned uh, also at the beginning, is looking at cross-fertilization on issue of substantive law. And I like to change into that, although of course we can't really, it's not like silos, and, and so Alina mentioned some already, so we, we it, 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 also that cross-fertilizes that too. And so the question that we're trying to resolve and address here is looking at how cross fertilization occur in areas of substantive international law, focusing on, on how different international courts and tribunals adjudicate sometimes similar substantive issues. Um, so what do they do? Do courts engage with each other? They cite or perhaps defer to each other? And, and what does it mean in practice? Does it mean that maybe there is a de facto hierarchy on the courts or some courts citing more than others? And what are the results of that? Uh, what evidence do we see for convergence or divergence over time on, on substantive issues, issues of human rights, law of the sea or others? Um, and I think this is a very interesting issue to explore. And I wonder if, Elaine, you can start us off looking a little bit at, at, at cross-fertilization on substantive issues and, and what, you, what, you see, um, it, what, what you see developing. Thank you. Um, I, I would, uh, uh, my answer would be about uh, what I could call two concentric circles. Uh, the first circle, uh, which corresponds to what was historically uh, these anxieties about fragmentation and the fact that uh, two courts seized with the, uh, the same set of facts uh, or the same kind of issues or the same uh, interpretive issues could take divergent position, diverging positions on them. Uh, and, and when it happened once between the, uh, the uh, International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the ICJ, uh, there was a big fuss in, uh, in the small world of international lawyers. If you look back uh, over the last three decades, in fact, there are very few cases where you can find an open contradiction between courts. And that's very interesting. And there is uh, probably a strong uh, sociological uh, uh, drive behind that in the sense that uh, uh, courts are aware of the issue, people uh, populating the courts are aware of the issues. And, uh, and so you, you will find very few occurrences of, of, uh, of open contradictions between courts. Um, on the contrary, you will find, as you mentioned, uh, cross citations. Uh, and, uh, and there you can see adjudicators using the work made by uh, others uh, to reinforce their own legitimacy but also um, and, and to try to influence. And this can be a tactic which is used in, in, in many uh, different types of situation. Um, the younger courts uh, tend to, to cite more other courts than the older courts, the eldest, especially the ICJ. We are all aware that the ICJ took a long time before uh, considering citing uh, other courts than the, the, the permanent court of international justice, its predecessor. But now uh, even the ICJ has come to cross citing um, other courts. So it has become, uh, I wouldn't say commonplace, but there is this, this idea. But it leads me to the, I would say, the second circle of my, of my reasoning. Um, between these cross citations, uh, you also have a slowly coming the idea that um, uh, courts should, through cross citation, also not only draw some legitimacy from what has been stated by another court, but also somehow defer to some competence or specific field of expertise. This is not for the RCG, which has a no 
and uh, all encompassing expertise, of course, but at the same time in the field of human rights or humanitarian law, citing human rights bodies has become uh, uh, more, more usual. And uh, with this comes this idea that uh, there should be some kind of deference towards the body in charge of, this, uh, of these fields. And uh, there uh, I would uh, tend to think that cross citation and uh, becomes a more uh, ambiguous. And uh, I say that also because the problem is the openness of international courts and tribunals to deal with issues which are not uh, historically viewed or traditionally viewed as pertaining to their field of expertise. It is human rights bodies dealing with the investment case through the right to property. It's investment tribunals, uh, says with issues of environmental law or human rights uh, aspects of their cases. And uh, there, if you reflect on cross-fertilization, you have to reflect on the will of these adjudicators to, to, to take over these issues which are not traditionally considered as belonging to, to, to their field. And I think that uh, I don't know whether it will lead to a fourth uh, era in cross-fertilization. There I have no, no idea. But uh, there uh, I, I think things are far more uh, ambiguous and we are uh, with some cases, recent cases like the um, um, Eco Oro case, for example, the, the, the very recent award which was uh, given in investment arbitration and uh, which followed the Urbazer case, uh, you, you start feeling that there is something about uh, maybe um, the ways of overcoming uh, the, the, um, the separation between several fields of expertise also in the heads of uh, adjudicators. So, um, but maybe a new field for cross-fertilization to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. This is going to be our next uh, book project and, and we'll see what happens. Uh, that will be uh, absolutely my pleasure and I'm sure Max too. Um, thank you for those who are already using the Q&A function and the chat uh, for us, for, for us, to ask questions and I urge you to, uh, to ask more. Uh, we continue with Alina. Uh, you, you mentioned the law of the sea and I wonder if you can tell us a little more about your very interesting uh, uh, take on uh, uh, on procedure on, on uh, substantive issues, substantive law and cross fertilization, especially in the um, in the area of the law of the sea. Yes, absolutely, uh, Chiara. Actually, in um, in the uh, in the in the book, I um, I did the story of how courts came to um, to to use the same method of maritime delimitation after a long time of uncertainty within the ICJ's jurisprudence itself. Actually, the, the court's jurisprudence was the source of great uncertainty, not only in international jurisprudence, but also as far as state uh, practice was concerned. And this uncertainty started in 1969, uh, where the court said that the method of delimitation should be equity, meaning a uh, subjective way of, uh, of applying the law, if we can put it very uh, like that. And um, it took uh, the court quite a long time to, to take back on this, uh, to get back on this uh, very bad solution. And it did it gradually. It never really admitted that it was wrong, but it started uh, step by step to use a method which was more predictable. Uh, and the concept of acute judiciary here comes into play uh, at the stage where uh, not only the ICJ uh, went for the for the three what is called the three um, stages methodology, which is based on 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 geometry of the coastline, but uh, the other tribunals, in particular ITLOS. ITLOS, when it was seized by its first case of maritime delimitation, everybody wondered if it will take the same, uh, will use the same method. And it was um, clear uh, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, which was the first case in 2012, that the tribunal did not feel compelled to follow the ICJ, but it followed it 
because it was uh, it was about consistency and predictability of the law. So at the center of this way of following the uh, big brother in the Hague or the big sister in the Hague was the idea of predictability of the law and predictability not for the judges, but for states which were the first addresses. And uh, then uh, the things, uh, the, the peace, a, a, a time of peace started in between the tribunals, where, as Ellen said, we started to have a lot of cross citations from the ICJ to um, to to the to eat laws and arbitral tribunals, in particular in the field of the law of the sea. And now it is done quite systematically. Whenever uh, the court refers to its own decision, it also refers to an arbitral award or an ITLOS decision. So. For the three-stage methodology, the acquis judiciaire really built uh, around the idea of predictability of the law, and this is very good. But beyond what I wrote in the article, I just want to draw your attention. You mentioned Somalia versus Kenya. Somalia versus Kenya, it's another case. It's not only about citation. It's about actually taking up the reasoning because the court finds it convincing. And in this case, it was about responsibility of states for activities in disputed maritime areas. The idea was to know if there is any place for responsibility for violation of sovereign rights, if ever there is exploitation of a disputed maritime area. And a chamber of it was decided that there was, um, there was no place for responsibility uh, within this context. And we see actually the ICJ taking up in Somalia versus Kenya the solution of, uh, of it was. I take it a little bit a step further, uh, the very interesting uh, Mauritius uh, versus Maldives case. In this case, it's about maritime delimitation, but it concerns Chagos, uh, the Chagos archipelago. And in this case, the tribunal could only can only decide on the, the delimitation issue if the sovereignty of Mauritius over Chagos is recognized as not being disputed anymore in international law. And the decision of the tribunal um, rests a lot, gives great, great weight to the advisory opinion of the ICJ. So this is beyond actually uh, just citation. It is taking it as an authoritative de decision of law. I'll stop here and leave it for discussion. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much. This is indeed very interesting. And, and I was talking to my students about this, uh, this, this very decision. I think it's, uh, it's really quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, John, I wonder if you can, can tell us something about your, your views about substantive uh, issues of cross-fertilization and substantive law from your, uh, from your perspective. Here too, I think I'm going to offer a fairly simple-minded perspective. Um, as has been pointed out, it is black letter law that there is no, uh, the common lawyer's rule of precedent does not obtain in international law. Article 59 of the ICJ statute uh, earnestly proclaims that the decisions of the court in a given case has no binding force except between the parties and in respect of the particular case. And in a formal sense, that's, that's of course true. Uh, but as has been pointed out, and as, as who, people who are engaged in international adjudication know, uh, that's not the whole story. Um, international lawyers, courts, tribunals routinely look across the horizon uh, for solutions to problems that they may, uh, they may confront. Uh, and particularly where there has been a pattern of consistent decisions in pointing in a particular direction, um, tribunals are going to be very loath to move in any different directions for the reasons that uh, uh, have been uh, compellingly explained here. Uh, or if you're going to move in a different direction, you need to find to come up with a very convincing explanation as to why. Uh, let me just, uh, speculate or speculate, comment a little bit on, on what is really a sort of microcosm of what we've been talking about. Um, I, I recently concluded, I, I was introduced as a judge on the NATO Administrative Tribunal. Unfortunately, that's no longer true. I have been kicked off by term limits. Uh, but for eight years, I was engaged with some very fine colleagues uh, in dealing with sort of internal labor matters in a large international organization. Now, staff members in an international organization, by and large, cannot sue the organization in national courts because of its immunity. 
Um, but for a whole variety of reasons, they have to have some reasonable and fair and objective avenue uh, for seeking redress of employment related grievances. And so NATO, like lots of other large international organizations has created its own in-house little labor court. Our small organizations often uh, make use of the uh, tribunals of larger ones, notably the ILO. Now, the NATO tribunal uh, applied a fairly well-developed body of administ international administrative law governing labor management relations within the organization. Now, where does this law come from? Now, some of it is reflective of past decisions of the tribunal or its, its predecessors. Uh, but there's also a, a great deal of uh, looking to the borders of other organizations and influential tribunals to see how they have dealt with similar situations. Uh, and indeed, a lot of the sort of seminal principles that are settled and accepted in the area uh, derive from decisions, uh, notably of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, but also decisions of the International Labor Organization. These have resonated beyond the confines of the Organ, the case and the organization in which they were uh, uh, articulated and have come to be accepted by players, by tribunals, by staff, and by organizations as reflecting the proper uh, alignment of legal interests uh, in matters of this kind. Uh, not through any formal rule of precedent, but through the kinds of processes that, that my colleagues here have. Uh, uh, so artfully described. Now we weren't bound by these in any legal sense of precedent, but we applied them. They applied sensibly, they were sensible, and they reflected the expectations of all of the communities involved. Now here, I'd like to add a little comment prompted by something that Helen said about the uh, growing interplay of human rights law. I think certainly any administrative tribunal uh, is keenly aware these days. Uh, that there are lots of people looking over their shoulders and that the immunity of international organizations may turn out to be a very frail thing uh, in the face of courts that are concerned that our staff members are indeed not given uh, a proper and objective opportunity to articulate their grievances. And so, although perhaps not expressed, I, I can certainly attest to the fact that uh, in a, in a well-run administrative tribunal, there is always a keen interest in assuring that there, the requisites of due process are met, uh, knowing that uh, uh, if they are not a disgruntled employee, may very well go to a national court, which may very well be unsympathetic with a, uh, a not very compelling decision, notwithstanding whatever protestations of organizational immunity may be made. made. Uh, now, the process goes on in lots of other more complicated settings. We've talked about those, and I don't have time to really go into it. Um, but I think certainly for the reasons that, that my colleagues have so artfully explained, uh, there is a great pull to convergence in many areas of substantive law. Thank you very much, John. I apologize for... Um the misattribution of the administrative tribunal, but I think uh, uh, I think it's uh, I really I really thank you for uh, for your interventions now and for um, all of your uh, very insightful comments. The uh, and actually it's interesting what you kind of using your experience as a, as a judge of the of the uh, NATO administrative tribunal because our third theme our third question that we'd like to address today is exactly that is talking about the role of actors because substantive law procedural law there are actors that apply it and so what is the role of, of actors in cross fertilization and actors not only judges and arbitrators but actors states and states that create the law, but use the law, use the court as, um, um, as respondent or, or in any ways as, as, or, or as claimants. Um, and what are the roles of secretariats, of members of secretariats, members of international uh, organizations? How do they operate and how do they make cross-fertilization real? Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, 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 contribution of our book is actually looking at this and looking at how actors uh, actually pr pr produce cross fertilization. And it's a pleasure to ask uh, Mark now to tell us a little more about 
the role of, of actors in cross fertilization. Terrific, thank you, Kiara. So uh, yes, so just to say that uh, from the beginning, part of this uh, volume uh, was always to uh, expand the list of usual suspects uh, in terms of uh, international judicial cross fertilization beyond the uh, judges themselves and beyond the state's parties to the regimes uh, uh, in which uh, international courts are nested and to think more broadly about what kinds of actors might be involved. Uh, so our plan was to have three chapters at the end of the book focused on that question. So there's a chapter seven by Kiara and myself exploring the nature and the motives of those actors. There's a chapter eight by Fidelma Smith, which has a great case study of the role of the Permanent Court of Arbitration as both a framework and an actor. Uh, in judicial cross-fertilization. And uh, there's a terrific chapter nine by Freya Bottens about the role of litigants and counsel and judges with respect to the question of, of forum choice, which we haven't discussed that much today. Um, so that was the plan. Although, as you've already heard, all of our authors ended up saying lots of really great things about uh, the full range of actors, litigants, counsel, international arbitral, arbitral secretariats, registries, international governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and many others who have stakes in uh, either championing or resisting judicial cross-fertilization. So in that context, I just wanna make two points uh, because I don't wanna take uh, too much time here. Uh, but first of all, uh, I have to mention the, uh, among, the among the panelists, um, infamous metaphor from Paul Reichler, who in a keynote for the first uh, workshop of this project, um, uh, made uh, a, a distinction between what he called two groups of actors in judicial cross-fertilization, the gardeners and the bees. And the gardeners, he argued, were actors like states, judges, international secretariats, who had a direct stake in the unity of the international legal order and who self-consciously seek to build bridges among the various functional and regional elements of that order. And then, Reichler contrasted those with a second group of actors into which he included himself, uh, mostly litigants and counsel, who generally have at best a weak state stake in the unity of the international legal order per se, but who might nevertheless borrow procedural or substantive innovations from other courts in the process of trying to win their case. And Reichler um, called these actors bees because they spread pollen around the system essentially as a unintended but foreseeable side effect of their normal self-interested activities. Um, and everyone in the project ended up adopting this metaphor and Kiara's in my chapter is called Of Gardeners and Bees. So if you uh, pick up the volume and you see lots of gardeners and bees, you'll know why. The second point that I wanna make from Kiara's and my chapter um, is simply that all of the actors in judicial cross-fertilization, including both the gardeners and the bees, have uh, very complicated and mixed motives. Uh, this is unsurprising for uh, the bees, as I said, since the bees presumably have a weak uh, attachment to uh, the unity of the international legal order. But we also argue that even gardeners, like international judges and arbitrators, who Boisson de Chazon tells us have a uh, deep concern for the unity of the international legal order, that those, uh, those gardeners nevertheless balance those concerns about unity with more parochial, but still very legitimate concerns about the substantive values and the autonomy of their own legal orders. Uh, this is a point Hélène made earlier about uh, oftentimes it's values that are involved here. Uh, and they're also concerned with their own primacy within those legal orders. And um, if you think about all of these actors, including the judges as having mixed motives, then the, the uh, well, I'll, I'll close here with a, with a quick reference to Eric Voten's findings in the, in the human rights realm in the book, because what Eric finds uh, in that case is that cross citation among human rights courts is actually relatively rare, highly selective, and highly asymmetrical, uh, with, as Ellen was saying, uh, the well-established European court rarely citing to other courts, whereas the younger inter-American court cites to Strasbourg uh, in virtually every ruling. Uh, and so uh, given this cacophony of actors and given those actors mixed motives, it's not surprising that the reality of cross-fertilization is 
uh, highly variable across uh, uh, across sectors and more asymmetrical and more complicated than the more optimistic managerial accounts might suggest. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you very much, Mark. This was a wonderful uh, overview and very substantive overview of, of, our, of, of, the, of the issue of actors and who are the actors and what motivates the, the actors and whether they're bees or, or, or gardeners. I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, Alina, can I ask you maybe just one or two minutes about your take on actors? We have about 15 minutes for the panel and I would really like to leave uh, at least about 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Alina. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very, very quickly, actually, I'm turning to the bees uh, to, to council. Uh, um, I, I, I'm really wondering uh, what is the role of council? States will try to uh, push forward for their freedom of interpretation of the rules of law. And uh, what is the role of council uh, in interstate litigation when they have to defend the most extremist view um, of, uh, of their clients? Should they try to temper this view and actually promote the this judiciary, even because otherwise it, they may be a, a, a lost cause? Or should they try to defend the, the positions their states could could, even if this actually means not going within the uh, within the direction of the jurisprudence? So that's one of my my queries, and I kind of leave it open because practice is very different in this respect. But there is one point with which I would like to I would like to raise. I would hope that council does not turn into a bumblebee within the meaning that. <laughs> Well, some, some, some council may try to appeal to the most extremist views of their state and of, uh, of, their, um, of their client. And this most extremist view actually means not complying with the law at all. And uh, is the role of council of uh, sustaining this, uh, this view and sustaining the state within this direction? And I'm just putting it out there like that. Thank you very much, Alina. It's true. We all have, as, as uh, participants in international law, bees and, and others, we also, what, what is the duty that we have to the gardens that we are, you know, getting our food from <laughs> also to a certain extent. Elaine, can you offer us maybe really again, just one, one minute or so, uh, your, your views? Yeah, just one minute to, to underline something which has not been said exactly yet, uh, which is the fact that although you have very diverse actors and, and far more numerous than what would assume at first glance, nevertheless, these uh, actors uh, belong to a small world. A small world where you see a lot of repeat players but also you see a lot of people changing hats and this has to be taken into account. And of course, I mean, you can say that uh, below the hat, uh, you still have a bee, but at the same time, I mean, this, uh, this uh, mix of various roles can also play a role also in relation to what uh, Alina uh, said. And uh, um, more and more people, uh, we didn't, we didn't think about that previously, think about careers in this small world. Before, uh, uh, I think that legal secretaries or referendaires uh, 30 or 40 years ago not necessarily thought about becoming a judge or an advocate general or whatever later. Whereas now you can see this kind of career plans. And so it can uh, play a role uh, also if people uh, change uh, uh, institutions because they, they come with a whole uh, culture Culture. And uh, we have to take into account this side of a small elite and uh, a, an, uh, a small elite which is somehow self-attested, you know, and uh, it's like a club in which it is difficult to, to enter. And uh, so um, I wouldn't say it's a boys club exclusively, it was a boys club, but it remains a, a club with this mentality. This may change because you have so many pushes for diversity now that you can have uh, more and more free riders in a, in a sense, if I can put it like that. And uh, it can change also the mindset. 
you may have people who become more activist uh, compared to previous generations, I think. And uh, there I join what uh, Chiara uh, said. Uh, it makes things uh, less predictable in, uh, in a way. And uh, so uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't, don't push further, but I wanted to attract uh, attention on these two tendencies. Thank mm -hmm. you. Th thank you very much. Uh, as always, very, very insightful, very interesting. The issue of uh, also um, the same person acting in different ways. I think it's very interesting and see how that uh, also impacts uh, cross fertilization. John, may I ask you also to maybe chime in and, and, and tell us what you think uh, very briefly about the role of individuals, uh, of, uh, of actors in uh, cross fertilization? Um, just a procedural question. We, uh, to mix metaphors, uh, we'll raise the question of when do we turn into a pumpkin? Do we have nine more minutes? Is that is that the case? Yes. Nine more minutes. Okay. Um, well, I will truncate what I had to say. Um, I, If I had my full rich allotment of four minutes, um, I would have talked a little bit about going back to the Iran-US Claims Tribunal many years ago, how it really was a, a seedbed where a whole generation of lawyers learned a lot of useful things and also learned about one another. And these people have gone on in a whole variety of settings in, in America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, carrying with them uh, lessons that they acquired and uh, attitudes they acquired way back there in the 80s. Uh, the second part that I would like to have developed had I had my whole ample store of four minutes uh, would be the tale of mass claims. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things the Iran tribunal didn't do very well was to handle its large number of small claims. A number of people worked on that, never came up with satisfactory solutions. Comes 1991, the creation of the UN Compensation Committee Commission, Several of those same people made the migration to Geneva and together developed the tools and techniques that the UNCC used to process 2.7 million claims. The UNCC finishes its works, closed down. Many of those same people then go on to other institutions, the real property institutions in Kosovo uh, and uh, Bosnia, um, the IOM's programs on slave labor and Holocaust, Throughout, there's a process of a small group of experts progressing through the development of a whole body of legal technology. So people do matter. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, this was really uh, the, the example of mass claims, I think is quite interesting when you see us as a cross fertilization in action and see how these people how kind of end up uh, in different places. Um, just a reminder that this is a CLE panel, and so Angela, if you could please show your uh, your PowerPoint with the CLE code that I also have. The CLE code is one seven two nine three two. Again, one seven two nine three two. Thank you. And um, I love to begin actually looking also as, a, as an opportunity also to begin uh, looking at the questions uh, that we received as an opportunity also to kick us off uh, to, uh, for, for, for some discussion. The first question uh, that we have uh, in the chat was an uh, issue of uh, enforcement and whether uh, we can think about uh, enforcement and whether there are maybe issues of cross-fertilization in, in, in terms of, of enforcement. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have any, um, any view on that. How can international courts rulings uh, be enforced? Is there any issue that uh, maybe you, want to, you can think about in cross-fertilization and, and, uh, and mechanisms that have uh, been used uh, there? I think, Angela, you can take these out now. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, why don't I ask two questions because we have a couple of, of minutes. Uh, so let me ask, so the, the first question is about enforcement, cross-fertilization and issue of enforcement. The other, which I think is quite interesting also is the issue of amicus curiae and, and whether the amicus curiae mechanism can play a role in, um, in cross-fertilization. Why don't we begin with these two uh, and then uh, we see if anybody would like to start us uh, with, uh, with, the, with, with these questions. We have about six minutes. 
Just one word on uh, Amicus uh, Curier. Like the parties or any pleading, it can play a role in cross fertilization by suggesting solutions to a tribunal and asking the tribunal to cross fertilize. So in this sense, uh, I would not find any originality. But uh, what I would like to mention is that Amicus brief, or the, the diffusion of Amicus Curie, the Amicus Curie practice is largely due to cross fertilization in my view, because uh, the fact that it developed in some courts uh, made it impossible for other dispute settlement systems to rebut this practice. And it was not historically uh, settled in investment arbitration, for example, but it had to be taken into account. The same in international trade law, where it was not really planned, but it had to be taken on board. So I would say that institutionally speaking, Amicus Brief is also somehow the result of cross-fertilization. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Alina, John, or Mark would like to add anything to this. Uh, not on the amicus curiae. I agree, although in interstate litigation, this uh, remains quite rare, but it loss is showing some, uh, some openness towards the amicus curiae and it remains to be seen if ever we get to, 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 a, to a real amicus curiae proceedings. But on, on enforcement, I don't know if, if in um, not really about cross fertilization because uh, the enforcement system in international law is weak. So what we may try to do is use examples of previous ways of enforcing whenever there was no um, willful compliance with a, with a judgment. The, the way to go with enforcement, of course, is either through countermeasures in international law, and this is the, the, uh, the, the executive branch that will, uh, will, uh, will go to it, or the Security Council, but that, is, that remains quite, uh, quite an illusion for the moment, the, the path of the Security Council. So not about cross-fertilization, but uh, negative solutions more than <laughs> cross-fertilization. Thank you. We have some other questions that I'd just like to read, and then if you'd like to uh, reply, um, feel free. One of the questions was whether we can speak, I think we addressed this already, but can we speak of a general principles of procedural law, as in principles that govern the procedure of any international tribunal, respective of the subject matter of the dispute it adjudicates? We, can, we address it a little bit when we're talking about procedural issues. And another one that I think is also quite interesting is whether specialized international tribunals should be obliged to decline jurisdiction when they do not come, when the, the issue do not come within its field of expertise in order to ensure the good administration of justice. Two separate questions, but I think it's quite interesting to see kind of maybe negative cross fertilization in the second, in the, first, in the, again, in the second issue uh, and more looking at general principles um, in, uh, um, in the first one. I don't know if you would like to answer any of these. Alina, John, Hélène, Mark, uh, I also, Alina, please go ahead. I don't know, maybe if John, no, because I don't see him on the screen, but oh, well, actually I wanted to, to, to give some thought on the, on the letter issue, the one of, uh, of the applicable law and the, the right tribunal for the applicable law, the forum non-convenience. Well, uh, to my mind, the problem in international law is uh, in general to find a tribunal that has jurisdiction. So uh, the, the question it will be, does the tribunal have jurisdiction and to what extent this tribunal um, expands its jurisdiction and the limits of the interpretation of the uh, of the constitutive instrument. So, um, but to, to some extent, of course, tribunals may try to be called, well, states may try to call the tribunals to deal with issues which are not within their competence. And I think it is the duty of the tribunal to re-explain what are the limits of this jurisdiction, because otherwise we are falling into this uh, trap of confidence into the system and uh, the confidence in the system also rests upon the, the limits of judicial, um, judicial settlement. But at the same time, uh, the ICJ in Somalia, Kenya, raised the issue of denial of justice within the framework of, uh, of the law of the sea. The, the wording was quite, uh, quite interesting to see in the, in the mouth of the ICJ. So that are my thoughts on this. Thank you. That's very interesting. Uh, John, did you, would you like to add anything? Uh, or Ellen, Mark, I think John, you're muted. You're muted now. 
there we go. 30 seconds worth. It seems to me that if a tribunal has jurisdiction, it has an obligation to proceed, but it has a variety of mechanisms to help it if it finds itself in deep waters. Every set of rules allows tribunals to require their own experts, and it is ultimately the responsibility of the parties to help. And so uh, I, I would be very loath if I was convinced that I had jurisdiction to simply say, well, I have jurisdiction, but I'm not smart enough, so I'm going to decline it. Thank you, Alas. This brings us to a, to a close, but I think this is quite interesting. Ellen, I'm sorry, do you mute yourself? Did you, did you want to no, say? No, no, no. I, I, I think at the end of the day, the last word by John was a, a wonderful <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> Well, I think what this also shows us is that it wasn't that we have to convene again, and I very much hope uh, that we will be able to do it. As Alain mentioned, this is a, a great group, and uh, I loved uh, really every minute of it. So thank you very much to our panelists for wonderful presentations and, and engagement uh, with, uh, with the issue of cross fertilization. Thank you very much to, to all of you, and thank you to uh, all those uh, that listened uh, today, uh, and we hope to see you again very soon. Um, and uh, thank you again and good night. <laughs>